Chapter forty five of the Old Curiosity Shop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens. Chapter forty five. In all their journeying, they had never longed so ardently, they had never so pined and wearied for the freedom of pure air and open country as now. No, not even on that memorable morning, when deserting their old home, they abandoned themselves to the mercies of a strange world, and left all the dumb and senseless things they had known and loved behind. Not even then had they so yearned for the fresh solitudes of wood, hillside and field as now when the noise and dirt and vapour of the great manufacturing town reeking with lean misery and hungry wretchedness hemmed them in on every side and seemed to shut out hope and render escape impossible two days and nights thought the child he said two days and nights we should have to spend among such scenes as these oh if we live to reach the country once again, if we get clear of these dreadful places, though it is only to lie down and die, with what a grateful heart I shall thank God for so much mercy. With thoughts like this, and with some vague design of travelling to a great distance among streams and mountains, where only very poor and simple people lived, and where they might maintain themselves by very humble helping work in farms, free from such terrors as that from which they fled, the child, with no resource but the poor man's gift, and no encouragement but that which flowed from her own heart, and its sense of the truth and right of what she did, nerved herself to this last journey, and boldly pursued her task. "'We shall be very slow to-day, dear,' she said, as they toiled painfully through the streets. My feet are sore, and I have pains in all my limbs from the wet of yesterday. I saw that he looked at us and thought of that, when he said how long we should be upon the road. "'It was a dreary way he told us of,' returned her grandfather piteously. "'Is there no other road? Will you not let me go some other way than this?' "'Places lie beyond these,' said the child firmly where we may live in peace, and be tempted to do no harm. We will take the road that promises to have that end, and we would not turn out of it, if it were a hundred times worse than our fears lead us to expect. We would not, dear, would we? No, let us go on. I am ready. I am quite ready, Nell. The child walked with more difficulty than she had led her companion to expect, for the pains that racked her joints were of no common severity, and every exertion increased them. But they wrung from her no complaint or look of suffering. And though the two travellers proceeded very slowly, they did proceed, and clearing the town in course of time began to feel that they were fairly on their way. A long suburb of red brick houses, some with patches of garden ground, where coal-dust and factory smoke darkened the shrinking leaves and coarse rang flowers, and where the struggling vegetation sickened and sank under the hot breath of kiln and furnace, making them by its presence seem yet more blighting and unwholesome than in the town itself. A long, flat, straggling suburb passed. They came by slow degrees upon a cheerless region, where not a blade of grass was seen to grow where not a bud put forth its promise in the spring, where nothing green could live but on the surface of the stagnant pools which here and there lay idly sweltering by the black roadside. Advancing more and more into the shadow of this mournful place, its dark depressing influence stole upon their spirits and filled them with a dismal gloom. On every side, and far as the eye could see into the heavy distance, tall chimneys crowding on each other and presenting that endless repetition of the same dull ugly form which is the horror of oppressive dreams poured out their plague of smoke obscured the light and made foul the melancholy air on mounds of ashes by the wayside sheltered only by a few rough boards or rotten penthouse roofs 
strange engines spun and writhed like tortured creatures clanking their iron chains shrieking in their rapid whirl from time to time as though in torment unendurable and making the ground tremble with their agonies dismantled houses here and there appeared tottering to the earth propped up by fragments of others that had fallen down unroofed windowless blackened desolate but yet inhabited men women children wan in their looks and ragged in attire tended the engines fed their tributary fires begged upon the road or scowled half naked from the doorless houses then came more of the wrathful monsters whose like they almost seemed to be in their wildness and their untamed air screeching and turning round and round again and still before behind and to the right and left was the same interminable perspective of brick towers never ceasing in their black vomit blasting all things living or inanimate shutting out the face of day and closing in on all these horrors with a dense dark cloud but night-time in this dreadful spot night when the smoke was changed to fire when every chimney spurted up its flame and places that had been dark vaults all day now shone red-hot with figures moving to and fro within their blazing jaws and calling to one another with hoarse cries night when the noise of every strange machine was aggravated by the darkness when the people near them looked wilder and more savage when bands of unemployed labourers paraded in the roads or clustered by torchlight round their leaders who told them in stern language of their wrongs and urged them on to frightful cries and threats when maddened men armed with sword and firebrand spurning the tears and prayers of women who would restrain them rushed forth on errands of terror and destruction to work no ruin half so surely as their own night when carts came rumbling by filled with rude coffins for contagious disease and death had been busy with the living crops when orphans cried and distracted women shrieked and followed in their wake night when some called for bread and some for drink to drown their cares and some with tears and some with staggering feet and some with bloodshot eyes went brooding home night which unlike the night that heaven sends on earth brought with it no peace nor quiet nor signs of blessed sleep who shall tell the terrors of the night to that young wandering child and yet she lay down with nothing between her and the sky and with no fear for herself for she was past it now put up a prayer for the poor old man so very weak and spent she felt so very calm and unresisting that she had no thought of any wants of her own but prayed that god would raise up some friend for him she tried to recall the way they had come and to look in the direction where the fire by which they had slept last night was burning she had forgotten to ask the name of the poor man their friend and when she had remembered him in her prayers it seemed ungrateful not to turn one look towards the spot where he was watching a penny loaf was all they had had that day it was very little but even hunger was forgotten in the strange tranquillity that crept over her senses she lay down very gently and with a quiet smile upon her face fell into a slumber it was not like sleep and yet it must have been or why those pleasant dreams of the little scholar all night long morning came much weaker diminished powers even of sight and hearing and yet the child made no complaint perhaps would have made none even if she had not that inducement to be silent travelling by her side she felt a hopelessness of their ever being extricated together from that forlorn place a dull conviction that she was very ill perhaps dying but no fear or anxiety a loathing of food that she was not conscious of until they expanded their last penny in the purchase of another loaf prevented her partaking even of this poor repast her grandfather ate greedily which she was glad to see their way lay through the same scenes as yesterday with no variety or improvement 
there was the same thick air, difficult to breathe, the same blighted ground, the same hopeless prospect, the same misery and distress. Objects appeared more dim, the noise less, the path more rugged and uneven. For sometimes she stumbled and became roused, as it were, in the effort to prevent herself from falling. Poor child! The cause was in her tottering feet. Towards the afternoon, her grandfather complained bitterly of hunger. She approached one of the wretched hovels by the wayside, and knocked with her hand upon the door. "'What would you have here?' said a gaunt miserable man opening it. "'Charity! A morsel of bread!' "'Do you see that?' returned the man hoarsely, pointing to a kind of bundle on the ground. "'That's a dead child. I and five hundred other men were thrown out of war three months ago. That is my third dead child. And last, do you think I have charity to bestow or a morsel of bread to spare?' The child recoiled from the door, and it closed upon her. Impelled by strong necessity, she knocked at another, a neighbouring one which, yielding to the slight pressure of her hand, flew open. It seemed that a couple of poor families lived in this hovel, for two women, each among children of her own, occupied different portions of the room. In the centre stood a grave gentleman in black who appeared to have just entered, and who held by the arm a boy. "'Here, woman,' he said, "'here's your deaf and dumb son. You might thank me for restoring him to you.' He was brought before me this morning charged with theft, and with any other boy it would have gone hard, I assure you, but as I had compassion on his infirmities and thought he might have learnt no better, I have managed to bring him back to you. Take more care of him for the future." "'And won't you give me back my son?' said the other woman, hastily rising and confronting him. "'Won't you give me back my son, sir, who was transported for the same offence? "'Was he deaf and dumb, woman?' asked the gentleman sternly. "'Was he not, sir?' "'You know he was not.' "'He was,' cried the woman. "'He was deaf, dumb, and blind to all that was good and right from his cradle. "'Her boy may have learned no better. "'Where did mine learn better? "'Where could he? "'Who was there to teach him better, or where was it to be learned?' "'Peace, woman,' said the gentleman. "'Your boy was in possession of all his senses.' "'He was,' cried the mother. "'And he was the more easy to be led astray because he had them. "'If you saved this boy because he may not know right from wrong, "'why did you not save mine who was never taught the difference? "'You gentlemen have as good a right to punish a boy "'that God has kept in ignorance of sound and speech, "'as you have to punish mine that you kept in ignorance yourselves.' How many of the girls and boys are men and women too, that are brought before you and you don't pity, are deaf and dumb in their minds, and go wrong in that state, and are punished in that state, body and soul, while you gentlemen are quarrelling among yourselves whether they ought to learn this or that? Be a just man, sir, and give me back my son. You are desperate, said the gentleman, taking out his snuff-box, and I am sorry for you. I am desperate, returned the woman, and you have made me so. Give me back my son to work for these helpless children. Be a just man, sir, and for God's sake, as you have had mercy upon this boy, give me back my son. The child had seen and heard enough to know that this was not a place at which to ask for alms. She led the old man softly from the door, and they pursued their journey. With less and less of hope or strength, as they went on, but with an undiminished resolution not to betray by any word or sign her sinking state, so long as she had energy to move, the child throughout the remainder of that hard day compelled herself to proceed, not ever stopping to rest as frequently as usual, to compensate in some measure for the tardy pace at which she was obliged to walk. Evening was drawing on, but had not closed in, when, Still travelling among the same dismal objects, they came to a busy town. Faint and spiritless as they were, its streets were insupportable. After humbly asking for relief at some few doors and being repulsed, 
They agreed to make their way out of it as speedily as they could, and try if the inmates of any lone house beyond would have more pity on their exhausted state. They were dragging themselves along through the last street, and the child felt that the time was close at hand when her enfeebled powers would bear no more. There appeared before them, at this juncture, going in the same direction as themselves, a traveller on foot, who, with a portmanteau strapped to his back, leant upon a stout stick as he walked, and read from a book which he held in his other hand. It was not an easy matter to come up with him and beseech his aid, for he walked fast and was a little distance in advance. At length he stopped to look more attentively at some passage in his book. Animated with a ray of hope, the child shot on before her grandfather, and, going close to the stranger without rousing him by the sound of her footsteps, began in a few faint words to implore his help. He turned his head. The child clapped her hands together, uttered a wild shriek, and fell senseless at his feet. End of chapter 45